church. How are we today? So let's rise up and give him all the praise because he leaves the 99 and comes after you because he loves you so much. So let's rise up and we ask God for his presence here and that he'll touch you, he'll touch me. And we thank you for it, Father God, in Jesus' name.
imagine you on time by coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me.
are your children, O oh God. We are your children for what you did for us, O oh God. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you, Lord, that we can call you our Abba, Father. Thank you, Lord. Because of you, we, we can walk. We can stand and sing. Because you split that sea for us, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for healing many. Thank you for touching many. Thank you for loving us, O oh God. We thank you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We give you all the glory, O oh God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. Good morning, RC family and all those who are connected with us for our Sunday morning worship service. Trust all of you are doing well. Glad to have you with us this morning. Well, the virus has changed so many things and I don't think life will be the same again. So many people are living in fear, anxiety, worry, and that there's so much of oppression around us. I sense that. Even when I speak to my friends overseas, they seem to be experiencing some kind of oppression and negativity. And therefore this morning, I thought that I will speak to you about the joy of the Lord. Psalm 16 verse 11 says, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The joy of the Lord is a precious commodity of heaven. And Anyone who believes in Jesus Christ can enjoy that. And the key to it is that you have to get into the presence of God. How do we get into the presence of God? Psalm 100 and verse 4 says that enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Grumpy people don't get an audience with God. We come to God because we are confident that He will hear us and He will help us. The Bible says that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And you must believe that He is God as you come to Him. He will solve your problem. Praise the Lord. And here we see that as we praise and worship Him and give Him thanks, we get into the very presence of God amidst all the negativity and hopeless around us. The Almighty God, who is the creator of this whole universe, who is our Father in heaven, loves us very much. And so we need to understand that he is waiting to come and help us and as we enter his presence we will have the fullness of joy for a christian the fullness of joy doesn't come through things through circumstances situations they may all change but the lord never changes and the bible says if you get into his presence you will have that fullness of joy in other words what happens is that when we thank god and praise and worship him we get into spiritual alignment and then as we get into spiritual alignment our focus is turned towards god and not the situations around us and so we need to intentionally engage with the presence of God. 
For example, he's with all of us right now. You believe that? And if you believe it, then you need to see whether you have the fullness of joy. Seriousness and sorrow and grumpiness are not from the Lord. In fact, the first fruit of the element of the fruit of the Spirit is love and then next comes joy. It's a part of the fruit of the Spirit because the Holy Spirit is in us. In fact, someone said that joy is Jesus over you. Isn't that nice? I heard this story about this great man, Smith Wigglesworth, he's one of my heroes. Uh, one morning he was a plumber before he came to serve the Lord and he had got ready to go to work and when he came down to have his breakfast, his wife was not looking too good and he had asked, what's wrong? And he had said both the, you, the children were having high fever and not well. And Smith Wigglesworth, being the man he is, he went prayed for his kids, had his breakfast and went to do his work. And he happened to work that morning in a rich woman's house. She was a very rich woman and he had to go and fix some plumbing thing there. And he was happy and he was singing and he was doing his work. When this woman came, most probably it would have been a Monday morning, and asked him, hey Smith, how come what makes you so happy? And then he had said, look, this morning when I came, got ready to come to work, my wife said that both our children are very sick. But I prayed and I knew that Jesus was there and Jesus will take care of that problem. And that's why I'm so happy. And she had said, look, I'm so unhappy, although I have all this. And wow, if Jesus is there, I too could be happy. And so the joy of the Lord is something that's so important. As we give thanks to God for all the amazing things He has done in our lives and we look back on the road that we have come and see those God moments, those divine interventions in our lives, the very fingerprints of God all over our life. Even sometimes when we didn't know that He was there. And we see how the Lord came and pulled us out of our various difficult situations. Then it helps us to be aware of His presence and see that God is always with us. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And then just allow him to put his arms around you or hold you by your hand as you walk through this life's journey. As we know that he's holding our hand, that gives us confidence and helps us to trust him and our faith levels rise up. And that helps us to face the road in front of us, no matter what mountain we face. We know that as he has promised, he will carry us through. He will in fact flatten the mountains and make the road clear for you. And so we need to have the confidence that as God has said in his word, that he will keep to his word. He will keep to his promises. In fact, the Bible says that the words that come out of the mouth of God will not return to him empty. It will accomplish what it was sent for. Now John 10.10 10 says that the thief who is Satan comes only to steal, kill and destroy. But Jesus came to give us life and that more abundantly. One of the biggest things that the enemy steals from us is the joy of the Lord. How does he do that? With lies and deception. He gets us to focus on our problems, our circumstances, and then he sort of magnifies it out of proportion. And then he starts bombarding our minds with that. 
especially as soon as you wake up in the morning. And that's called torment. He knows how to intimidate us, how to harass us, how to torment us. And so there's a battle in our mind as to whether we are going to take all that lies in and what Satan is saying or whether we are going to take in what God says in his word and come to agreement with those words. The problem is that when we accept those lies, Satan brings it, we can reject it. And the Bible says casting down those thoughts, imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. We need to cast it down. But if we receive it, then what happens is we open the door to Satan. We get impressed by what he's doing. And then we cannot thank God. Sometimes people come and say, Pastor, I can't even pray. And he locks our jaws, as it were. And he, as you get tormented, and as you give into that oppression, you go spiraling down to depression, which in turn produces frustration and anger. Then what happens, you start entertaining those negative thoughts and before long, you're going to speak out negative things and confess those negative things as it, as such as it's never going to work. I'm finished. It's not worth living and that type of thing. Proverbs 18, 21 says life and death are in the power of the tongue and those who love it eat its fruit. Life and death are in the words that we speak and the very words that we speak will come to pass. That's God has given so much of power to words. As you know, he created the whole universe with the word. And so the Bible says be careful. But when we start talking negative things, when we start murmuring, grumbling, complaining, basically what we really do is we are worshipping Satan. Be careful because Satan wants to exalt himself and when we start, you know, magnifying our problems and talking about it, what happens is we, without us knowing, we enthrone him in our hearts. And as we come into agreement with that, we empower him and all he does is to destroy us. And he brings a thick, dark cloud of oppression over us. But on the other hand, when you come into agreement with what God says and come into agreement with his word, then Jesus is over you. Joy comes. You have open heavens. You have your breakthroughs. And so here we see that when Satan is over you, there is so much of depression, negativity, and it's a closed heaven and it's bad news. Fear comes, faith goes out of the door as it were, and with fear comes doubt. James in chapter 1 says that when you start doubting, you're like the waves that are tossed and driven by the wind and that you will dash upon those rocks and he goes on to say that a man who doubts will receive nothing from the Lord. Isn't that sad? We have to come into agreement with what God says when two or three people agree it says wow there's so much of power and you get your breakthrough. And so a double-minded man, the Bible says, is unstable in all his ways. In fact, the Bible calls negative talk an evil report. You know, when we confess something that's negative, what we do is to come into agreement with what Satan is telling us. And he only has a pack of lies here. And he's trying to deceive us because he wants to destroy us. But on the other hand, God is saying, no, reject that. Trust me, receive my word because I am a God who keeps to my word and that's the truth. And so I want, I have told this before and I want to tell it to you today again. 
because of the, the atmosphere that's around us. Do not nego ever negotiate with Satan because that's not the deal. In Numbers chapter 13 and 14, you get the story about the 12 spies that were sent to spy out the promised land. And we know how they came back divided. There were 10 in one group and two in the other. And the 10 guys brought an evil report. God had told Moses, look, I've given you that land, given you. He was not saying, I'm going to give you. He said, I've given you. But they had not still received it. But it was like holding the title deed to that property. And they went and they saw what God had told them was true. But because of their grasshopper mentality, they rejected God's word. They said, yes, it's a good land. But nevertheless, we can't possess it because there are giants. But you see the spirit of Joshua and Caleb because they came into agreement with God's word. Because God had said, I have given you that land. And he said, we can take that land. We can possess that land. Let's go and take it. And we know what happened. And that's his story. Those 10 guys never possessed their inheritance. They were circled around in the wilderness and all the people who joined them till they up, they dropped down dead. But Joshua and Caleb lived. Unfortunately, they had to circle with these guys for 40 years, but they lived to possess their inheritance in that promised land. These are biblical principles that operate even today because it's the same yesterday, today and forever. Jesus, think about this, never said to talk about your problem. He said, speak to your problem. Command that mountain to go and fall into the sea. But sometimes we speak so much about our problem and sometimes we magnify it. And what we do is, as we do that, we get impressed with Satan's works. And that really poisons our worship. You know, God told the children of Israel categorically, do not go and worship the gods of the Amorites. In other words, don't get impressed with those gods because before long, your worship of Jehovah will get polluted and you will just accept anything that those gods tell you. And you get destroyed in that. Beloved, know your position in Christ. That's very, very important because that brings us freedom and liberty and breakthrough and victory. And Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 says that you and I who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior are seated together with Jesus in heavenly places. Think about it. It's in the present sense that we are seated. Not that we will be seated one day when we die and go to heaven. We are right now. Our spiritual position is that. Yes, I'm standing here on planet earth. But in my spirit, I'm in that realm. And the Lord says, I have given you superiority in that realm. Because I have given you my delegated authority. And for what does he give us that authority? To rule and to reign. To be more than conquerors, as it says in God's word. And so we need to exercise that authority. And when Satan comes to steal our joy, we need to fight back and we need to protect that. We can't allow him to steal that. You see, in the story of David and Goliath, David knew that he was a covenanted child of God. In fact, he got angry and he ran towards Goliath with just a catapult and five stones and this is what he said as he ran towards the enemy because he did not compare Goliath with himself he compared Goliath with his mighty lofty God and then Goliath looked like a dwarf and he said who is this uncircumcised Philistine 
who defy the armies of the living God. What did he mean? What did he mean when he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? What he said was, who is this guy who's outside the covenant, who is trying to mess around with God's covenanted people? Wow. Hebrews chapter 8 gives us the new covenant where God says, I'm the God and they are my people. I will take care of them. Isn't that enough of an assurance? Even everything around us may be upside down. Jesus is with us. Now Nehemiah says in Nehemiah chapter 8 verses 9 to 10. This is what Nehemiah says. Now this is the secret of the joy of the Lord. And no wonder Satan comes to rob it. It says, And Nehemiah who was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Through the wilderness journey, they had not read the word. You know, and here we see, sorry, not the wilderness journey, when through the exile in Babylon, they had not, they didn't read the word. And after a long time, now they are reading God's word. The temple was built and they were reading God's word. And then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet and send portions to those who for whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now this is the key to why we should be joyful in the Lord. Find things to be joyful in the Lord. I'm sure no one can say, God has done nothing for me. He has done amazing miracles. I can tell you of many things he's done in my life. In fact, some of them are like one in a million miracles. And I say, wow, God, you did it for me. And what he does for me, he will do for you. We are all his children. And here we see that if Satan is able to steal the joy of the Lord, from us then he's won the day because with that goes our strength we become weak our inner man becomes weak and when our inner man is weak our outer man gets weak and then we go to depression we go into depression and then we just wonder what happened and so here we see that the enemy is always trying to push he's trying to force negative things into our thought life there's a battle there it's up to you to choose what you're going to receive. Either you cast it down, pull down those strongholds and don't give Satan a foothold in your life, especially your thought life and come into agreement with what God said in his, says in his word because for sure he gives to his word. And so once you give in to the enemy with those negative thoughts, he steals your joy. And then you become weak and next thing he tramples you. When Jesus said, you go and trample the enemy. And so today we need to think, is Satan under our feet or on top of our head? But there's a way out from this. That when we start praising and worshipping and thanking God and remembering all the wonderful things he has done, then our confidence comes back. Our faith comes back. And our spirit gets into alignment and our inner man gets strong and then we can put him under our feet. Amen. Now Ephesians chapter 6 says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. There's no point getting angry with people around us. There's no point getting angry with the situation around us and getting frustrated because things around us don't look too good. But we believe in a God who gives us hope. In fact, one of his names is hope, according to the book of Romans, where Abraham, against all hope, believed in hope. The world's hope can be maybe yes, maybe no. 
but God's hope is yes, I will do it for you. And here we see that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. The battle is between Satan and us. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this age and spiritual wickedness in high places. Paul says that. So don't get deceived. Don't ch chase after the wrong enemy. But go for the real enemy. The enemy who comes to steal, kill and destroy everything from us. And praise God because of what Jesus did at Calvary. He took those keys back from the enemy and gave it to us and said, I give you the keys to my kingdom. That whatever you bind on earth that is already bound in heaven will be bound. We can't stop Satan in his tracks. Exercising that delegated authority as Jesus Christ is our Lord. And so we need to understand that Christians are not undergoers, we are overcomers. We are not victims, we are victors. We are a blessed people. And so we need to stand up and fight. No wonder Paul said, I fought a good fight. It's a battle all the way. The enemy comes to trip us and trap us. The enemy comes to discourage us and just help make us give up on everything God has for us. And praise God, amidst all this chaos and confusion, God is working out something good for us. It's payback time. It's promotion time. In Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17, we all know he says, no weapon will prosper. No we weapon that's fashioned against you will prosper. Beloved, weapons will be fashioned against us. We might get the blow, we might fall, but it will not prosper. We need to stand up and fight. Not through our own strength, not by our own might, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because up to now, he has not lost any battle. He has no battle scars on him at all. And so he will fight our battle. And he says, fear not. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says the same thing. And I will build my church. Who is the church? Not the building. You and I. I will build my church. He's building his church through us and with us. And he says, the gates of hell will not prevail. The strategies and the plans of Satan will never prosper. If you know how to come into conflict with him and by the power of the Holy Spirit, get him under your feet. Because he has no authority. He has no power. Because when Jesus rose from the dead, he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. All authority. You know, it's just simple arithmetic. If Jesus says all authority has, is with him, how much authority has Satan got? Zero. But how do we pump up Satan and talk about our problem? It's the thing that matters. We have to be careful. The truth is, he has no power. He has no authority and so he has no power. But when we come into agreement with him and not with the word of God, what happens is he usurps that authority God gave us. The same thing he did to Adam and Eve. And then he tramples us. So we need to be wise. We need to be careful. And the thing is that here, God is promising us all these things. No weapon fashioned against you will prosper. The gates of hell will not prevail. And there are so many things the Lord has told us. But the secret of this is that we need to fight like the children of Israel fought and took possession of their inheritance. We need to appropriate what God has got for us at Calvary. It doesn't just fall on our laps like ripe cherries, you know. We need to appropriate it in faith. And so we need to come against the enemy and not allow him to rob us of the joy of the Lord. Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's so important that we do that. He did the same thing with Jesus, didn't he? He came 
to rob the joy of the Lord that Jesus was having, the joy that he was having about accomplishing what the Father has given us. He tried to rob it at the, at the last moment in the Garden of Gethsemane to a point where Jesus almost said, Father, just take me back. And after he battled with Satan, in that garden, his three disciples that he took for support just slept. They, they just fell asleep. And Jesus had to battle it all alone. That I believe was the biggest battle that he had. Satan came all the time to get him. But I believe his biggest spiritual battle was at the garden of uh, Gethsemane, where his sweat turned into blood. And he got Satan under his feet and he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And from that point onwards, Satan knew he couldn't rob that joy. And see what it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Jesus went to the cross with joy. Was he out of his head? No. That was his strength to face that ordeal, that terrible suffering, that terrible agony. And so the joy of the Lord is so important. It says, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He knew that the Father will keep to his part of the promise and exalt his name above all other names and he will be seated at the right hand of the Father. He believed in that and he received that. That's a kingdom principle. You don't receive and believe. First you believe and then you receive. That's faith. Psalm, chapter, Psalm 34 verses 17 to 19. It says the righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have, bro uh, have a broken heart. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. Is your heart broken today? The Lord is near you. That's what he says in his word. And it says here, And save us such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Not some of them, but he says, I will deliver you out of them all. Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord because he keeps to his word. So why are we holding on to our problems? Why are we struggling with our problems? When the Lord has given us a commandment, do not be anxious. Why are we anxious? Why are we fearful? Fear and faith can't ride the same boat. Fear is putting trust in the wrong person. Faith is putting your trust in Jesus who died for you on a cross at Calvary because he loves you so much. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, this is what he said. He said, give over your work, your business, your plans, yourself, your life, and even that of your, the life of your loved ones and everything into the hands of God. And when you have given all right into his hands, there will be nothing to worry about. Amen. Sometime back I spoke about consecration. Where we give everything over to the Lord. Because Satan is trying to push all that between you and God. Then we go out of focus with God. And without knowing we have seated our problem, our situation on the throne of our hearts. And before long we are worshipping that. And no wonder we get destroyed. But the Lord is saying, no, that is for me. That throne room was made for me. And when you become a true worshipper, you will experience open heavens. Amen. So as we prepare for communion this morning, today is the first Sunday in the month of August. Well, we've already come to the eighth month. Let us focus on what the Lord is doing speaking to us. We need to take him at his word, be like a little child, not try to reason out, but trust him 
and he says in 1 Peter 5 7 casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you casting all your cares cast everything cast is a violent action it's not just going and leaving it cast means to throw it all ye who are heavy laden and weary the Lord is speaking to you and saying just throw that at my feet don't carry it the enemy wants you to get weary and give up on me the book of Galatians it says, do not grow weary, continue trusting the Lord, doing the right thing because you will reap in due season if you don't faint. And Satan is trying to rob the joy and when he robs the joy, we have no strength, we faint. And then he tramples us when we should be doing that to him because his head was crushed at Calvary and the Lord said, you go and trample those serpents and scorpions and Nothing of the enemy will harm you. Beloved, we need to come to agreement with what God says. Rise up in faith and move forward. Because that's the season of the church. And so, as I close, you know, the word joy in the Hebrew is rena. Rena means shout, like jubilation of victory like when they fought a war and and there's jubilation and celebration and people are shouting he say the what the lord is saying is i said it is finished the battle is over i destroyed the works of the devil at calvary and therefore you celebrate in the midst of your problem in the midst of your storm just celebrate shout with jubilation and when you do that, Satan knows he can't play with you. And he will do that and you will have your breakthrough. As we sing, you know, it's, you know, we sing that song that sorrow is only for, lasts for a night, but joy comes in the morning. There, morning is not an AM or PM. Morning there means wake up. That's the time to wake up. We need to wake up. What are we doing? Why are we giving it to Satan? And why are we just allowing him to trample us when we should be doing that to him? Because we are the glorious church. The glory of the Lord has risen upon us. And beloved, this is the time for you and I to rise up in this darkness around us and shine the light of Jesus so that others will come to know the goodness of God. The glory of the Lord you know, as it covers the waters of the sea, who carries the glory? You and I. <coughs> we are the glory carriers. And the Lord is saying, shine. Dispel the darkness. And so we need to wake up. We need to wake up. We cannot just allow Satan to deceive us anymore. And so as we prepare ourselves for communion this morning, let us just reflect on what God has said. Let's repent for not taking, taking him at his word, for not trusting him and tr trusting the enemy more than him. The enemy didn't do anything for us. He comes only to steal, kill and destroy. But he is Jesus who died for us on a cross. <coughs> and the word says that he did that to give us life and that more abundantly. He wants to give us abundant life. And so as we spend a little time in quietness, reflecting on all that the Lord spoke to us this morning because He loves us and His truth sets us free. Let us put our hearts right, be washed and cleansed in His precious blood so that we partake of His table worthily this morning so that His blessings will flow to us.
The Bible says that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Jesus got whipped so that we could be whole. For by stripes we were healed. He took upon himself all, all our sickness, disease and infirmity so that we don't have to suffer. That's what his word says in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 17. Confirming what Isaiah said in Isaiah 53 because healing is a part of the atonement. And that's your inheritance and my inheritance for which Jesus paid the price and suffered dearly. And therefore this morning, let's trade in all our sicknesses and diseases and infirmities and receive that grace of healing. I believe there's someone who's watching and connected with us this morning who's having severe migraine attacks and you're really tired of it and the Lord wants to heal you. There's someone who's having a back problem, chronic back problem and trade it in because Jesus paid the price so that you don't have to suffer and receive his grace of healing. That's your bread. And there's someone also who I sense that is having uh, breathing problems. I don't know whether it's some allergic condition or asthma, but the Lord is healing you. He loves you and wants to see you well. And any other sickness, the Lord is here. He's the healer, the miracle worker. And the Lord wants to release that grace for which he paid the price because he loves us. Lord Jesus, as we partake of your table this morning, I take authority in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and I command every sickness, disease and infirmity to be removed from whoever is suffering. And I release that grace of healing because your word says that you paid for it and by your stripes you were healed. And I just pray for healing miracles to take place. For we are your body. And Lord, your body is whole. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's partake of it together. Thereafter he took the cup and when he had given thanks and blessed it, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Drink it in remembrance of me. Beloved, we are covenanted people. No uncircumcised Philistine can touch us. Not one hair will fall from our head without his knowing. Everything around us might, might, might be falling to pieces. There may be chaos, confusion, uncertainty, hopelessness. But when you're walking in covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you experience open heavens. Because the Bible says that 2,000 years ago, answering Isaiah's prayer, he rendered the heavens and came down to bless people. And therefore, even as we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and surrendered our lives, we are covenanted people and that covenant was sealed with his precious blood. And therefore, as we eat and drink out of his table worthily, this morning, his life will flow to us as we proclaim that we are in total union with him. That's what we are doing through communion. His abundant life will flow to us and blessing us so that we can showcase our father and show what a good father we have. As his glory is upon us, we need to arise and shine so that 
The darkness will be dispelled. People who are in hopelessness will know there is hope. That they will know there is a good God who loves them to a point where he died on a cross for their sin. So that salvation will come their way too. And they will receive the gift and the miracle of eternal life. This is the season that we are living in. And as we drink from this cup, allow his life to flow into you. Let's partake of it. Loving Father, we thank you once again for this beautiful morning. It's, uh, Lord, like a beginning of another month and the first Sunday. We thank you, Lord, that even as we walk in covenant relationship with you, storms may hit us, but we will not go down with it. Because you are in our boat as we go through life's stormy seas. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us. You'll be with us to the end. Help us to develop an intimate relationship with you, spending quality time with you, worshipping you, praising you, reading your word and meditating upon your word. And Lord, loving your spirit to lead us at all times. Thank you, Lord, that we are not alone. And as we hold your hand and walk through this uncertainty, you are certain, you are faithful, and you will take care of us and our loved ones. We praise you and thank you once again. And bless you and ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, God bless all of you. Have a great week and hope to see you next Sunday.